there. And Abby's like, we're not ready yet. So, okay. So we might not be online yet. We'll be online when Dave is up there. All right, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, announcements for today. We have a business meeting today after the service. Um, Bible study is at 6 o'clock tonight for Bible study number one. Are we doing Bible study this week? Wednesday night. Wednesday night. What did I say? You said tonight. It's not tonight. Sorry. It's Wednesday night. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's, it, the hair was in my ear. Sorry. Um, we're not doing choir this week, so after Bible study, we can all go to Dairy Queen. <laughs> and Bible study number two. Daytime Bible study. We have daytime and nighttime. You know, the nighttime is where all the party animals are. The daytime is, I don't know who's coming to that one because I, I still have to work. But um, that they're going to meet for that on Thursday at 1 o'clock. And the pastor his change is tweaking his uh, office hours. He was coming Tuesday and Wednesday. Now he's going to come Wednesday and Thursday with that afternoon Bible study, hopefully starting on Thursday. Uh, Tuesday, got the right day this time, is the meal. We're having spaghetti. Uh, salad, garlic bread, and strawberry shortcake. Oh, yeah. So that is the menu for uh, this month. And the uh, missions committee is looking for menu item ideas. So if you have any ideas that we can throw out there that are easy to make for a whole lot of people, um, let us know what those are. Hamburgers. Hamburgers, yes, we talked about that. Um, Kenny Newsom, Reverend uh, Kenny Newsom is going to uh, on a pilgrimage to Israel and Palestine. He's going February uh, 2024. And here is the itinerary and the announcement if you and uh, an application if you want to go. I'm going to put it on the bulletin board in the back, but he uh, emailed this to me and it's out there for everybody to see. I'll put this under here and then don't let me forget it. And we have one more. And it's written in cursive, so I have to put my glasses on. Uh, this is a thank you. Uh, dear Beulah family, a heartfelt thank you from me and my family to you for all the calls, food, text, flowers, and visits. It is so appreciated. I cannot thank you enough. With sincere regard and love, Julie Johnson and the Johnson family. So we're just hoping she's up and around soon. Any other announcements that I missed? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Got a big crowd here this morning. I guess uh, a lot of people got it over with last week, didn't they? So, but I'm glad each and every one of you are here. Do we have the web up yet? No, we're up. Okay. <laughs> if you're out on the web, we're glad you're with us here this morning too. Uh, we would like for you to send us a card or contact us and let us know you're listening. But I'm glad each and every one of you are here this morning. So uh, Tommy had told me I needed to start telling jokes again. So I got a little story this morning. The pastor of a small church, his, one of his buddies that he went to, uh, to seminary with was passing through town. So he come in. He said, oh, I'd like to stay with you a few days. He said, OK. So when his friend got there, he said, well, you want me to preach this Sunday, give you a break? And he said, well, yeah, you can. He said, but I want to warn you. He said, at my church, he said, I have a problem. He said, a lot of times people will get up and leave late in the service. Those that want to go fishing or those that want to get to the restaurant first or those that want to go ride the boat riding. He said, so you'll have to watch for that. So his friend said, well, I think I can take care of that. So. The Sunday morning when he got up to preach, he, uh, they had introduced him. He said, look, those of you that have ears to hear, I want you to listen. He said, I've got a two-part sermon this morning. One part is for the saints in the house. The other part is for the sinners in the house. He said, now I'm going to do the part for the sinners first. So he preached for about 10 or 15 minutes. And he said, okay, folks. He said, that was a part for the sinners. If you want to leave, go ahead and leave now. 
Come on, Tim, help me out. <laughs> but glad each and every one of you here this morning. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. And Lord, I thank you for each and every one that's here this morning. We thank you for your love and your provisions and your grace. And Lord, I just ask you to be with us this morning. Lead and guide us. Be with our pastor as he brings the message. We love you, Lord, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we're going to sing. Come thou almighty king. Come thou almighty king. Please stand.
Thank you. Thank you both. Good morning. Good to Good see morning. you all. Um, we have a uh, few folks watching out there. Terry's in Fredericksburg. Rayetta is in Indiana. Um, perhaps Casey's watching with her. Yes. yes. Good. And uh, Kristen is in Bedford, Texas, one of our usual attendees. Good to see you, Kristen. Good for you to see me. She always loves it when I say that. And uh, Linda and Everett are here, uh, not with us, but with us, just right down the road, a little piece. So glad you're there, and uh, I assume, Linda, I assume you're home. I haven't heard word, but uh, I knew she was supposed to be home by now. So you're nodding your head. Do you know she's home? She came home. Came home yesterday. Glad to know that you're home. Um, this is our prayer time. We want to continue to pray for Julie's recovery, for Linda's recovery. Uh, Bobby has been in the hospital. Does anybody have an update on Bobby? I haben't talked to him in a day or so. Yeah, Ken. I visited Bobby on Saturday. Bobby was in great shape. Came back today. He's doing good. He was off his oxygen, oxygen, and uh, he even gave uh, the doctor permission to call for me. Well. And he said he's doing very good. He's protecting all. Right. She's not responding back there. I don't know if you know any more, Kelly. She's got a thumbs up. Bobby, we know, is doing better. I saw him on Wednesday, and he went down from there and then back up. And uh, it's good. Glad, I'm glad to get a good report on him. And Doretha is still at home, very sick, with a cold, and it's, it's keeping her down. So I want to be sure and pray for her. I also want you to know, if you don't already know this, that Cindy Verlander has been in the hospital We've been praying for her family because of Brody for weeks. Um, you probably have heard that Brody passed away this week. Um, and uh, subsequent to that, Cindy actually went in the hospital, and she's still there. And so I want to continue to pray for her. Um, they can't really settle on, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of surmising. I'm not really reporting, but I'm surmising that they can't really settle on funeral arrangements for Brody till his mom's out of the hospital, and so she's got to recover just a little bit and get back on her feet. So I want to continue to pray for the Verlander family. That's my list. What is? What are your prayer requests this day? Yes, sir, Ken. Also pray for Janice. Janice Miner, she has hand surgery on uh, Friday. Janice Miner had hand surgery on Friday. Let's pray for her. Yes, sir. Ted. Um, this was happened a couple weeks ago, but we've been traveling so much and haven't been here. Um, me and my friend Norman um, on the prayer list, he had, had, a, uh, had heart surgery. Everything went well. Um, but he's going to be on our monitor for a couple of weeks and some special medication for a while. Everything so far looks pretty good. Okay. Uh, Ted is asking us to pray for his friend Norman, who had heart surgery that went well, but he's going to be on monitors and and certain medications and such for a little while, so want to be sure and keep Norman in our prayers. Mary. Uh, I do pray for Gary and I, who are on a car-loop trip on uh, effective Tuesday, and my car wouldn't start this morning, so I do pray for him. Um, where are you going, Mary? Uh, we're going to get changed. <laughs> All the way. All the way in your RV to Beth Page. Well, be safe on the road all the way over there. And back. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Absolutely. We want to pray for Mary and Gary as they travel their, um, their jaunt over to Beth Page. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Lori. So she knows for 
she'll be okay, but just help her in her journey through this. Okay, so, so let's pray for Patricia, Lori's friend, who was involved in a, an accident that, from which she suffered some injuries and it totaled her car. Um, so uh, we want to pray for her. And if you have a car you're not using and you want to um, um, think about how you might help Patricia, that might be a very tangible and concrete way. Any other prayer requests? David. The Jones family, uh, you know, they are traveling to, to Georgia, and the grandbabies uh, both, both have COVID, but they're doing well, Mama says. So. Um, and how is Trent? I heard Trent caught the, had COVID as a result of babies. Do we know? We know. Okay. Um, so we want to be sure and pray for the Jones family who are traveling to Georgia and the, the, the grandbabies, I had heard one had COVID, but now they both have it, you're saying. Um, so we want to be sure and pray for them. I, I'll say um, I praise God that, that none of the rest of us, nor Joan particularly, um, who sat real close to them, uh, ended up with it. Uh, so I want to pray for all of them. Other, other prayer requests? Mary? Um, Kathy, not Tom, my sweet Mary will raise him. I mean, I can see it in my tears, but we want to know how to help her, but help me to be able to help her. Um, what did you say? What's happening with her? She's deteriorating. She's deteriorating. Okay. So Mary's asking us to pray for her sister, Kathy, her twin sister, and specifically that God would help her deal with uh, her sister's declining condition and help her. Absolutely. How about praises? Thank God for the rain. Thank God for the rain. Yes. Uh huh. Lori? Other praises. Pretty weather, surely. Yes, ma'am. Paul got a job. Paul got a job. He did. I know uh, many of you have been praying for that, and I appreciate it. Right now, he's working for Pepsi, and I'm a Diet Coke person. <laughs> We praise God that Paul got a job yes. and that Mama's happy. Of course, that we can come to church. Pray for our country. Our country, absolutely. <laughs> Let's pray together. Loving God, thank you for this day for the beauty around us, for the pretty weather, for the relative health that we enjoy. And while we are here praising your name, lifting our friends and family members in prayer, we are mindful that there are so many needs around us health and recovery needs like Julie or Linda or Bobby or Doretha, Cindy, Janice, grieving families like the Verlander family and others. <coughs> God, we thank you for friends who also have needs like Norman. We praise you that his, his, his heart surgery went well.
we're thankful that we have friends like Phil or Patricia who, like us, also have their own needs. Pray that you would help Patricia recover from her injuries. Pray that you would provide a car for her through us or other ways. Thank you for faithful families like the Jones family who are so attentive to their children and grandchildren, to the Johnson family who's so attentive to Julie, to all of the minor family and the ways they're related and take care of one another, how we can love and take care of Beth, how Mary loves and takes care of Kathy, and even so, how we are distressed over Kathy's decline. Pray that you would help Mary and sustain her. We're thankful for rain and for church, for our country, for children who get jobs and can keep them. God, our, our need list is long, but our, our hearts are full of love for you, for each other, for this place, for the familiarity of worshiping you in each other's company. God, thankful for your faith. Thank you for your faithfulness, for taking care of us in ways we see and ways that we don't see. For all of the people out there who pray for us, who are calling our names in their churches. May we be good stewards of all of your many blessings this day. God, we ask you to forgive us for the things we have done that we shouldn't and the things that we have not done that you would have preferred that we did. God, we pray that you would find pleasure in our worship this day. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Our offertory hymn is Man of Sorrows. Please stand with me and let's sing together.
text for today comes from the Gospel of John. It's uh, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Hear these words, according to John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced that they had seen the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them this time. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet who have come to believe. Amen. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through you have life in his name. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Have you ever given any thought to just how fantastically and frankly utterly unbelievable the Christian faith actually is? If it were easy to believe, if it were simple and straightforward and not full of the miraculous, well, it wouldn't take any faith. It's the fact that it's unbelievable that requires our faith. We read, we say, we believe Jesus turned water into wine. That's impossible, and yet we know that he did that. We believe he did that. We say that we know that, we, that he did that. Jesus walked on the water. This wasn't someone who could swim really fast or... Uh, this was an unbelievable feat. He walked on the water. Jesus commanded a storm to calm. And of course we know the story. The weather calmed down. The seas leveled out. Jesus fed thousands of people. In one account it says 4,000 men. Another one says 5,000 men. That doesn't count women and children. So I'm going to say he fed thousands with a mere handful of but a handful of food. On multiple occasions, Jesus gave sight to the blind, including some who had been blind from birth. He healed at least 10 people with leprosy. He raised Lazarus from the dead. And if this short list is not enough, he was crucified himself. He was dead. He was buried. And he arose from the dead to live and reign with God. As Unbelievable as it is, the story of Jesus strikes me as also quite unthinkable. It seems to me that it is unthinkable that God would set up a system of forgiveness that requires a living sacrifice and then requires the life of God's very own Son so that that sacrifice would appease all of our sin, everyone's sin. man 
would not only sacrifice his life, but torture along the way, that is, as we know Jesus did. As we know this story so well, I think we understand God's ways. We've all read the book or parts of the book. We think we understand God's ways. We think we understand God's plan. But when our own reality, Beth, slaps us in the face, as it did this week with Brody's death, we realize that our trusted understanding, frankly, can appear feeble. So I'm going to use another parable uh, like I used a week or two ago. Uh, this one's not one you probably have heard before either. This is not from the Bible. This is from Anthony DeMello's book, The Song of the Bird. Um, and this parable, I hope to illustrate just how much we don't know. Then we'll go back and review our text, or at least the first verse or so, and I'll go over it. I'm not going to go through every verse like I often do, but we'll talk about the beginning verses there anyway. And then I'm going to talk about some faulty beliefs or tricky faith traps that, frankly, too many Christians impose on the rest of us whenever we suffer. Why? Because sometimes the faith that we develop around the unbelievable shows limits when we come face to face with the unthinkable. If you'll just hang on, I think you might enjoy the ride. Here's the story from Anthony DeBello's The Song of the Bird. Once upon a time, there was a mouse that wandered through the jungle. He was having a good day, darting here and there, dodging the watchful eyes of the hawk above. As the mouse meandered along, he eventually came upon the community watering hole where he found um, his elephant friend taking a bath. The mouse became terribly distressed. He began jumping up and down, trying to get the elephant's attention, making quite a commotion. The elephant, meanwhile, was in his own world, relaxing in the warm, muddy water. It felt good to his parched, dry, leathery wrinkles. Eventually, the elephant realized there was a squeaky disturbance in the bushes a few feet away. Finally, the elephant realized that his mouse friend was making a frenzied commotion, seemingly trying to get his attention. The elephant turned a weary eye toward the mouse and asked, what's your problem? The hyperspastic mouse demanded that the elephant get out of the pool. The elephant, surveying the situation and seeing neither danger nor any threat of danger, returned his gaze back to the comfort of the cool water, the warm mud. The mouse was going crazy. He demanded that the elephant get out of the pool over and over. The elephant just didn't understand. He had been minding his own business. He was enjoying the water and the mud. But he did want to be kind and gracious to his mouse friend. And eventually, slowly, deliberately, the elephant lumbered to his feet and moved to the edge of the pool and then out of the water completely. With reddish-brown water dripping from every fold of his rich, dark skin, impatiently he asked his mouse friend what was so urgent that he needed to get out of the comfort of the water and the mud and the heat of the day. Because, said the mouse, I wanted to see if you were wearing my swimming trunks. <laughs> At which point, the elephants, elephants could actually turn on a dime, and with much disgust, he returned to the comfort of the pool. Now, I know you all fairly well, and I know that you're probably wondering, what does this mouse and elephant have to do with seemingly impossible and potentially unbelievable aspects of the Christian faith? And, of course, I will tell you that answer eventually. I will say this. I think the story of the mouse and the elephant, though fictional, might be a lot like the impossible things Jesus' closest friends experienced in John 12. 
They saw, they heard, they felt, they experienced one impossible thing after another. And their experiences were, were real. I wonder what it was like for them to update their faith with the unbelievable, with the unthinkable. We're going to look at just a couple of verses, as I said. Verse 19 says, it was evening on that day. Which day? Well, before daylight, Mary Magdalene had gone to the tomb that same day. In other words, we're talking about Easter night. When she found the stone rolled away, she returned to, to town. She found Peter and John. They ran back to the tomb. After Peter and John looked into the tomb and found it empty, Mary Magdalene again looked into the tomb and found two angels. And they asked her, why are you crying? When she turned, there stood Jesus, though she did not recognize him at first. After he called her name, Mary recognized him. And we read all this last week when then Jesus sent her on disciples and tell them that John says Mary did as she was to the disciples and she had seen the day that same day was the first day of the week you know by the way that's why we're here right that's why we're here on Sunday and not on the Sabbath um, Jews take the first Genesis creation account God worked for six days and rested on the seventh and we worship on Sunday, what we call the first day of the week, because every Sunday is like a little Easter. We're celebrating the resurrection every time we get together on a Sunday. Verse 19 continues, the doors of were locked for fear of the Jews. Well, here I'll ask you to remember that verse I read last week again, when John said the, that the disciples went home. Well, I think it's the home to which John was referring. Sometimes we need a little additional context in order to understand that the most accurate interpretation might not be the literal interpretation. Why were Jesus' disciples afraid of the Jews? Well, probably guilt by association, wouldn't you think? That Jesus was guilty, so therefore they might be guilty in the eyes of the religious leaders. wonder what the disciples thought about what Mary Magdalene had told them that morning. Again, this is the evening They've been together, hiding in the room behind a locked door. Peter and John did not see Jesus or angels. They simply saw an empty tomb. There were linens lying there. Mary, on the other hand, had seen angels and Jesus. John said he believed, but he also said as yet they did not understand the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead. I wonder what John actually believed whenever he said John believed. Did he believe that Jesus had risen from the dead without knowing what it meant? That, did he believe that Jesus was the Son of God? Did he believe that Jesus was the Messiah? I wonder how what John believed might have been different to what Mary Magdalene believed. She had seen the risen Christ. He had seen an empty tomb. We don't always believe exactly the same thing. Perhaps John believed something. He says he did. Perhaps Mary believed something slightly different. We've all actually experienced Jesus a little bit differently, haven't we? Then John says, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. I wonder how the apostles integrated Jesus' miracles, all of them, into their emerging and growing faith. I mean, when Jesus turned water into wine, what does that prove? That Jesus is a magician? No. I wonder how the apostles integrated the feeding of 5,000 or the feeding of the 4,000 into their faith. Was Jesus just another miracle worker? You know there were itinerant preachers who were walking around performing miracles, at least seemingly. How was Jesus different? I wonder how the apostles integrated Jesus' healing miracles into their faith, healing the blind, healing the lepers, raising Lazarus. I mean, all of these were impossible, right? I wonder what it meant to them that Jesus was doing the impossible day after day after day, time after time after time. Now he was 
quite impossibly, standing before them after they had seen him dead, after they had put him in a tomb. Unlike Jesus' first followers who are referenced in this story, we have the luxury of a couple of thousand years of history, of a couple of thousand years of theological writings, of a couple of thousand years of trying to assimilate and think about what does all this mean? What does this entire story mean? They had the luxury of seeing it firsthand, but they also had the, the, the burden of having to make sense of it right then, in the moment. Were they seeing a ghost? Were they seeing the Son of God? Were they really seeing Jesus at all, their teacher, their rabbi, their friend, their mentor, the very Son of God? Of course, we know they decided they were seeing all of these things in the living Jesus. And we've decided that as unbelievable as all of this is, we have decided to believe this incredible story and put our faith in this risen Savior. Amen. So if you'll let me, I'd like to turn our attention away from this text to some practical faulty beliefs, tricky faith traps that often follow tragedies. These things feel a bit removed one from the other. The story of the text and the story of our lives as we've experienced tragedy in the untimely death of a child among us. Because some of us are walking through death's dark valley these days. And because just like we need to update our faith with the unbelievable, we probably need to update our faith with the unthinkable. If you're wondering with me what I mean by faulty beliefs or tricky faith traps, let me illustrate with just a few. Some people say you aren't supposed to question God when tragedy strikes. I'm not one of those folks. Some people say it. I hear it. I've heard it for a long time. I want to point out to you just a couple of problems with that notion. Abraham not only questioned God, he negotiated with God for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. For emphasis. If you recall, there was quite an extended conversation between Abraham and God about can, can you find just 50 righteous people well, God, what if there aren't 50, but there are 40? Abraham questioned God. But not, what if there aren't 40, but what if there are 30? Would you still destroy this city? Well, what if there aren't 30, but 20? What if there aren't 20, but 10? And Abraham negotiated with God, questioning God time after time. If you, if you want the reference, that's Genesis 18. A couple of chapters later in Genesis 32, we have a story where Jacob wrestled with God. Not just arguing as sort of one-on-one -on -one and as a dialogue of a verbal in, in interaction, but we have a clear record, a history uh, written in, in the book of Genesis in Genesis 32 where Jacob wrestled with God. Samuel 2, Hannah challenged God over her childlessness. She, she would have a child. She bargained with God. Child, I will devote him to you. I could keep going on. Job, uh, God, I don't even have enough time or paper to write down how many questions Job asked of God. Read the whole book. It's only 31 chapters. It'll take you six hours. Just go right. There's lots of questioning God time after time. Suffice it to say that it's absolutely biblical to question God, and God can take it. God is not so fragile as to not take our questions. Some say if tragedy strikes, well, you must not have had enough faith. Please don't believe that either. This one is particularly insidious. It's laced with judgment. The person who makes such a statement doesn't know the mind of God in ways they can't possibly know. Some people say things like, well, God just needed one more angel, and I want to say how desperately wrong this is on two points. First, God doesn't need angels. God is quite sufficient. 
If God wants angels, God makes angels, but he doesn't do it out of humans. There's no evidence anywhere in Scripture that persons ever, 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 ever become angels. We may be ultimately spirit, but we don't become angels. That's perverted thinking. It's perverted theology. It doesn't happen. In fact, there's ample evidence in Scripture that persons and angels are quite distinct beings. The last faulty belief I'll raise is this. Some people say God took him or her because God needed her or him more than we do. Again, God doesn't need any one of us nearly as much as we all need God. It's faulty thinking, it's backwards thinking, and it's, it's, it's frankly judgment in a way that's just not very grace-filled. Finally, in, a few, in the last few weeks, I've been asking you what it might look like to update our faith. And today we've talked a bit about how uh, both the unbelievable and the unthinkable challenge us to update our faith from faulty myths, from faulty theology, from perverted ways of thinking that, that aren't helpful, particularly in times of grief. So about that story of the mouse and the elephant, uh, why would I tell you such a parable about an elephant wearing a mouse's swim trunks or not? Well, it's really pretty simple. Um, you see, it's easier to believe that a swimsuit of a mouse will fit on an elephant than to think that we have a complete understanding of God's love and God's grace. It's all about perspective. We have a glimpse of God's love and God's grace. We have a glimpse of how God's system works. And as try as we might to craft sound theology, we are bombarded by friends and family members who regularly assail us with well-intentioned traps that are easier to fall into. And it's far easier simply for an elephant to wear mouse trunks than for us to understand the love of God. Please pray with me. Loving God, as we try to love each other and care for each other, as we try to understand your will and your ways we know that our thinking is man's thinking we are flawed in our approach we are are flawed by our our inability to understand all that you all that you are and all the the love that you have for us God, we continue to endeavor to update our faith by meeting together, by listening to one another, by reading your word, by rightly dividing your word. And we are challenged by the unbelievable and the unthinkable. We pray this day that you speak to us that we hear your word as you would have us to. As we endeavor to be your children the way you want us to be. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of decision is Room at the Cross. I invite you now to consider how you are updating your faith. And if you need to rededicate yourself to uh, Christian walk, uh, this is the time. Uh, won't you stand with me and let's sing together, Room at the Cross.
Please pray with me. Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you forgive the sins of any, they are retained. May we leave this place as the children of God, seeking to be God's children as he would have us to be. Go now in peace. Amen.